Hey everybody, welcome back to the class. Uh, this video we will go over chapter 26, uh, Fluid, Electrolyte, and Acid-Base Balance. Uh, this chapter is the shortest of the remaining chapters that we have in the course. So that means our next test will focus primarily on the urinary system. Uh, the information that's in this chapter will be covered, obviously, but there's just not enough without getting you know, too deep into the, uh, the chemistry portion to balance out the test where it's equally chapter 25 and equally chapter 26. So our next test will be probably 75-80% on the urinary system and a, it's a small portion on this chapter. Alright, when you're talking about the word balance, for water and electrolytes, that means having equal amounts that are entering the body and leaving the body. And there are several mechanisms that are used to maintain this balance. So being in balance with water and electrolytes means there is a stability in the body at all times. Water and electrolyte balance are interdependent. That means if you affect one, you're going to impact the other. If you have a higher amount of water being lost, that's going to impact the levels of electrolytes. If you have electrolytes being lost, that's going to impact the amount of water. So you cannot mess with one and not mess with the other. They are interdependent. All right, next we'll talk about the distribution of fluids. The fluids that are found within the body are not uniformly distributed. There's a, a very marked difference in where fluids are found. And fluid will occupy various compartments that have different volumes within the body. So we have movement of electrolytes and the movement of water in between these various compartments. And it has to be regulated in order to stabilize how well they are distributed. There are about 40 liters of water and there dissolves electrolytes within the body. And they're divided into two major compartments. Fluid that's inside cells and fluid that is outside of cells. The fluid that is inside of the cells are in the intracellular compartment. And this is a majority of the fluids within our body. This is about 63% of all body fluids. Fluid that is outside of cells is in the extracellular compartment. And this is about 37% of all body fluids. Now some examples of extracellular fluid. Uh, interstitial fluid, uh, blood plasma, lymph, uh, transcellular fluid. And transcellular fluid would include things like uh, cerebrospinal fluid, uh, synovial fluid found in between uh, various joints. So all these are examples of fluid that are found outside of cells. So I would take note on what is and is not an example of extracellular fluid. This is an illustration of the last two slides. So you have the intracellular fluid here, about 63%. Then the rest of this would be extracellular fluid, and that could be broken down to interstitial fluid here in this light blue, blood plasma, lymph, transcellular fluid. But all of those are examples of extracellular fluid. Right, next topic we'll talk about is water balance. Again, this means the amount of water you're taking into the body is the amount of water that will exit the body. And homeostasis requires the control of both the amount of water that you take in and the water that leaves your body. The maintenance of that internal environment depends on how well your kidneys are working and how well they can vary the amount of water output. Uh, water intake, this will vary greatly by every person depending on their diet usually, but it's roughly about two and a half liters per day or 2,500 milliliters for an adult. Most of that will come from just regular drinking fluids. So about 60% from drinking, 30% uh, come from moist foods uh, like fruits, for example. And the last 10% is a byproduct of metabolism. A very common product of chemical reactions within the body is water. Well, in order to distinguish that from water that you may be drinking, the water that is formed as a product of a reaction, that's called water of metabolism. And the primary regulator for water intake is, like you would imagine, thirst. A water output, water can be lost through uh, multiple ways. Of course, urine is going to be the most dominant one, so that's about 60% of water loss is through urine. You can also lose water uh, from sweat and feces and through evaporation from the skin and with the lungs, that's about 28%. And the primary regulators for water output of the body are the collecting ducts and the distal convoluted tubules of the kidneys. Now, those will control what will eventually go on to the minor calyx, major calyx, renal pelvis, ureter and then going out to be excreted. Whatever material is in the collecting ducts will be excreted out as urine. 
right, here is, is an illustration comparing the last few slides, comparing water intake and water output for a average adult. So it should be around 2,500 milliliters or two and a half liters. So, uh, water and beverages, when we talk about intake, is about 60%. Water from moist foods, about 30%. Then water of metabolism, the last 10%. And we talk about water output, majority of it will be through urine, about 60% in urine. Uh, water loss through evaporation and through uh, exhalation from the lungs, about, 20, about 28%. And then feces and sweat, about 6%. So again, these are balanced, 2,500 milliliters, 2,500 milliliters. Uh, next topic we'll talk about are electrolytes. And there are many electrolytes that are important for cellular function. We'll just talk about some of the most important ones for our class. That's going to be sodium, potassium, and calcium. And these are the proper ways to write those ions. So Na plus, that indicates it's an ion. So that's sodium ion, potassium, of course, the symbol is K, and the plus indicates it's an ion. And then calcium, is Ca, and then two plus. But again, there are many, many more electrolytes that are found within the body. But these are the three that we will focus on here. The primary regulators for electrolyte intake is hunger and thirst. So whenever you are hungry or whenever you are thirsty, that's going to drive you to you know, get something to eat, get something to drink. And by doing that, you will have an intake of electrolytes. Now, the body will lose electrolytes uh, perspiration through sweating. And, of course, if it's uh, a warmer day outside, you're going to sweat more, so you will lose more electrolytes. If you are exercising, you will lose more because you're sweating more. Uh, some electrolytes are lost in feces. And the greatest output of electrolytes is through kidney activity, and which leads to urine output. You can also lose electrolytes through uh, things like vomiting or diarrhea, for example. So that's why whenever you have a situation like that, it's important not only to replace the water that you've lost, but also to re replace the electrolytes that you've lost also. All right, next we'll talk about acid-base balance. And there are multiple definitions for what an acid and what a base is. The definition that we will use uh, for acids, these are electrolytes that ionize in water and release hydrogen ions, so H+. And bases, these are substances that will combine with hydrogen ions. And they also will release hydroxide ions, OH minus. Now maintaining the balance between acids and bases involves uh, the regulation of hydrogen ions within uh, body fluids. So this is the key to maintaining an acid-base balance. Even very slight changes within hydrogen ion concentrations can dramatically alter the rate of metabolic reactions or shift uh, distribution of other ions or even modify hormone actions. It's something we've talked about previously is the pH number or the pH scale. That's going to indicate to what degree a solution is either acidic or basic. Another term that you may see for basic substance is alkaline. So the more acidic the solution, the lower the pH. So the numbers between 1 and 6 on the scale. The higher the numbers, the more alkaline it is. So the number is 8 to 14. And the number 7 on the pH scale is neutral. It's neither acidic nor basic. So again, here's an illustration of uh, the pH scale. So the lower numbers are acidic, and then the lower the number you get, the more acidic it is. Uh, seven is neutral, so think of distilled water as a good example. The higher numbers are more alkaline and more basic. And then the higher the number, the more alkaline it is. All right, now we'll talk about the strengths of acids and bases. Stronger acids will ionize more completely and will release more hydrogen ions. A strong base will ionize more completely and release more hydroxide or other negative ions. So that's the indicator that you want to look for. If it's releasing H plus or hydrogen ion, it's an acid. If it's releasing OH minus or hydroxide ion, that means it's a base. Uh, next topic is the regulation of hydrogen ion. Having an acid or an alkaline shift in body fluids can cause some very serious uh, changes in the internal environment. Normal metabolic reactions will generally produce more acids than bases. So this is why you have to regulate very tightly how much hydrogen ions are, are made and how to deal with them. So maintenance of this balance will focus on eliminating acids in one of three different ways. Through a buffer system, through the respiratory excretion of carbon dioxide, or the renal excretion of hydrogen ions. Uh, chemical buffers. Uh, these buffer systems are found in all fluids 
and focus on stabilizing the pH of a solution. And the whole point of these is to make a strong acid a weak acid or make a strong base a weak base. And we've already seen an example of this in a previous chapter when we talked about bicarbonate ion released from the pancreas. Its whole point is to neutralize the very low pH of the chyme, leaving the stomach entering the small intestine. So it's taking something that's very, very strong and making it much, much weaker so the small intestine can tolerate it more easily. So that's what a buffer system is. And there are three kinds of chemical buffers, uh, bicarbonate, uh, phosphate, and protein buffer systems. Now on this table, this is explaining in more detail how these buffer systems work. This is more detail than, than I would ask. So when it comes to this topic, just be able to recognize what is and is not an example of a chemical buffer. All right, next we'll talk about the uh, respiratory excretion of carbon dioxide. The respiratory center uh, within the brainstem helps to regulate the hydrogen ion concentration by controlling the depth and the rate of how you breathe. As cells produce carbon dioxide, that carbon dioxide will combine with water. So this combination of water and carbon dioxide forms an acid called carbonic acid. This acid will break down, and when that happens, it's going to release hydrogen ions. So your breathing rate and your breathing depth will increase to eliminate more carbon dioxide. Because if carbon dioxide isn't there, it can't join with water and form a carbonic acid. So it can't release hydrogen ions. Okay, so this is a flow chart with the information from the last slide. You have cells producing carbon dioxide here. That carbon dioxide will combine with water to form carbonic acid. That's what this is. When this breaks down, you get the release of hydrogen ions. That will cause the respiratory center to be uh, stimulated, which will make you increase the rate and the depth of how you're breathing. And that will cause more carbon dioxide to be eliminated. And that will help eliminate the eventual presence of hydrogen ions. Right, uh, next topic is the renal excretion of hydrogen ions. Now, the nephrons will help regulate these hydrogen ions by excreting them into the urine. And the tubular secretion of hydrogen ions is linked to the tubular reabsorption of bicarbonate ion. Last topic we'll talk about for this chapter are acid-base imbalances. Having a pH of below 7.35 is called acidosis. The blood is becoming more acidic. Anything above 7.45 is alkalosis. It's becoming more alkaline, more basic. So here's where you want your normal pH to be between 7.35, 7.45. Anything less than this is acidosis. Anything more than that is alkalosis. And once you get below 6.8 or above 8.0, probably not going to be conscious and you're probably not going to be alive for much longer. Because at that point, there's such a dramatic change in metabolic function that you probably aren't going to survive unless that's uh, corrected very, very quickly. All right, we'll talk a little more detail on acidosis and alkalosis. And there's one key word within both of these topics that people tend to overlook, and that's this word, or. So acidosis can be formed by the buildup of acids, like you would expect, or having a loss of bases. Having that loss of bases by comparison means that the blood will be more acidic. So you can have acidosis formed by either of those situations. There are multiple forms of acidosis. Uh, we won't talk about metabolic, but we will talk about respiratory acidosis. So having a damage to the lungs will lead to a decrease in the breathing rate. And that decrease in breathing rate leads to a buildup of carbon dioxide. So more carbon dioxide being present means it can combine with water more easily, which means more carbonic acid is formed which means there's more acid that can break down and release more, hydro more hydrogen ions. That's going to make the blood more acidic because you cannot breathe enough carbon dioxide out. Now, the opposite of that would be alkalosis. Again, keyword here is or. This can be brought on by a buildup of bases or having a loss of acids. Probably the easiest, easiest example of alkalosis is hyperventilation. So whenever someone hyperventilates, there's an increased loss of carbon dioxide because the person is breathing so quickly. Well, that loss of carbon dioxide means there's a decrease in carbonic acid. That loss of that acid means the blood's going to be more alkaline. So this will cause the pH to rise. 
All right, so here is what we just had on the last slide, but with a flow chart. So things like high altitude or anxiety, a fever or poisoning will lead to someone hyperventilating. Uh, hyperventilation, you are losing more carbon dioxide. That excessive loss of carbon dioxide means it's not going to be around to combine with water. So that means there's a, or there's a decrease in carbonic acid. If there's less carbonic acid, that means less hydrogen ions are going to be made because it's not there to be broken up. So that loss of an acid means it's going to be or going to lead to alkalosis, respiratory alkalosis. This is why if someone hyperventilates, an easy fix is to have them breathe into a paper bag. What you are doing is rebreathing carbon dioxide. So you're trying to stop this step from happening. So that's the whole point of breathing into a paper bag in that situation. You're trying to introduce carbon dioxide back into the blood so you don't have a decrease in carbonic acid. So the pH doesn't get too high. All right, that brings us to the end of this chapter. Like always, if you have questions, feel free to put them on the discussion board. Or you can talk to me during my online office hours, the Monday and Wednesday mornings, 9.30 to 11. Or you can email me or text me directly with any questions you may have. You know, this chapter is relatively short, so our next lecture test will focus primarily on the urinary system. But information from this chapter is covered, but the bulk of our next test will be the urinary system. So thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.